Jack and the team this morning for leading and the worship team as well. And of course, we have new visitors with us uh, arriving. Okay, can I just check uh, the screen here? Is it on? Uh, it's on there, but it's not on the screen here. Let me just... I was told this morning it was working well uh, during the Mandarin congregation. As uh, Sister Su Peng has shared about the prayer, I think it has uh, given us uh, an understanding of uh, what we are doing when we pray and uh, asking God to work in our lives and in the lives of uh, the nation and the people that uh, God has connected us with. Uh, we pray for the nation as uh, Brother Sung King has led us in prayer. We pray for Alpha as Sister Jean has been uh, led us just now. And we pray uh, for individual needs. And uh, through this journey, uh, that started, uh, we normally have a physical prayer meeting, but uh, with the MCO pandemic, we switched to Zoom. And we've been so comfortable with Zoom that only the last two months, uh, our elders was raising up, should we come back to the physical? So we have started uh, to have a once a, a month, every first Wednesday, we meet here in the chapel and uh, to pray together as a group physically and uh, but the remaining um, time we pray uh, on the zoom line now in the individual prayer i have never prayed for a person who have gone through a heart transplant so in our journey these few years we have uh, been keeping in prayer persons with a heart transplant and of course sicknesses and, and many other things that, uh, that prevail because we live in a, a world that is still dominated by sin, by death, and by sickness. Jesus has already conquered that, but it is not yet, right? A day will come when we will be given a full restoration, but we already tasted the beginning of it. Okay, so... Uh, this is uh, something that we want to encourage all of us to come together and uh, uh, pray together and learn to listen uh, to what God is saying to us. I may have shared before that in the process of uh, praying, uh, one of our members felt very strongly that we should pray for a certain political leader. It was never on our prayer points. Uh, but we took that as something that the Lord is impressing. And so we uh, came up and uh, prayed, uh, put a prayer point for this person. And we don't mention the name. We just put a, a letter in front uh, praying for this person that God will intervene. right? And he held the highest office in our land. And we are praying for him. And one of the brothers in our prayer meeting remarked, and I thought it was so uh, touching. You know, a person is already in jail, yet people in FBC are praying for him in jail. If I'm in jail, who would be praying for me, right? But it just so amazes me that as the Lord leads us and we hear what he's leading us to do, we follow and we obey. And so we've been faithfully praying that God will touch this man's life and that God will reveal himself to him and bring people with beautiful feet to proclaim the good news of Jesus to him, right? And uh, so this is something that is uh, ongoing. It is a, a living a relationship that we have with God and with one another as we pray. Okay, 
We've been talking a lot about prayer. Let us uh, commit our time to the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for uh, gathering us together. And indeed, the people of God throughout this city, this state, this nation, and through the nations of the world, gathered in the name of Jesus to worship you in spirit and in truth by listening and obeying the word of truth because your word is truth and your word is life. Father, grant that your Holy Spirit will give us understanding and our hearts will be tender and yielded as we listen that our heart's desire and hunger will be to apply and to obey what you have laid upon our hearts as we begin this uh, book of Jonah. Lord, that you would teach us uh, what is it that you want us to know? What is it that you want our lives to be changed by your word? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, we've got the, the I've entitled the uh, slide, uh, the chapter here. We're starting Jonah chapter 1. And uh, it's running from the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Running away from the God of heaven. That is the word that Jonah used to describe the God that he worships. We are finishing uh, the uh, uh, Minor Prophets uh, this year, 2024. Okay, this is a, a timeline of uh, what we are looking at. And uh, you notice that uh, the Minor Prophets is what the eldership has said, okay, we try and aim to finish it by this year. And so today, beginning, we're looking at Jonah. We have two more small books to, to finish, Obadiah, one, one chapter, and Malachi, four chapters. And we would have covered the whole of the minor prophets. Okay, now, they are called minor not because their messages are unimportant or minor or second rate but minor in the sense uh, that, uh, of their size, okay? If you look up the major prophets, who are the major prophets? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, okay? Uh, you have the 12 minor prophets and you have the major prophets. Uh, the fact is they are minor because the major prophets, the books that are written are twice as long as the 12 books all combined. If you combine all the 12 minor prophets, right, the major prophets is twice as long. So the minor ones are just, uh, some are one chapter long and we're going to go through Obadiah. You notice uh, they're in uh, blue, Obadiah and uh, Malachi. We're going to go through it after Jonah. And uh, they, are, they are small in terms of the size. But also, there are books of the Bible that you find that it's very hard to locate. If people ask you, can you look up Nahum and read from us? Some of us are good. You, you immediately know where to find it. Some will have to go to the table of contents to find the page number and refer to it. So others will try to skip forth, back and forth, desperately hoping that Nahum would leap out from the Bible. So over the next two, three weeks, we are going to look at the most famous one, I think, of the minor prophets, and that's Jonah. Why he's so famous? Because he was swallowed by a fish, okay? And as we have just uh, going through, going to do, through it, right? Uh, it's interesting that there are four chapters, but there are only three verses that talk about the fish. So the fish is not very important, all right? Jonah and Nineveh, and the people in that city is very important to God, not the fish, right? Um, but that's what we remember uh, the book for. What is the book really about? Why was Jonah swallowed? What does it indicate to us? What is the message of Jonah? And we're going to go through that over the next few weeks. So what is God saying to us through the book of Jonah? It's a very beautiful story, poetic in a sense. Uh, you have the prayer next week, but the song will lead us through that. And it's a cry of the heart of a person praying from inside a fish. 
right? No way to go before he was vomited out. And that is the sort of prayer that you and I will experience when we are in crisis and in dire straits. It is a simple and straightforward uh, uh, book, Jonah, and there's no complexity involved about it. And let's uh, begin by reading it together, right? I'll uh, invite you to read it out loud. It's always good to hear the Word of God as we read it out. And uh, can we just follow the screen? Uh, it's got 17 verses. Let's read it together, okay? Jonah flees from the Lord, starting from verse 1. Let's read together out loud to one another. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tashish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tashish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you please. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Amen. Today, I just want us to look at uh, Jonah chapter 1, beginning with this quote from a Jewish writer, Pagans exalt sacred things, the prophets extol sacred deeds. Okay, there are two kinds of people that we're going to look at uh, in Jonah chapter 1, the pagans and the prophet. So we first turn to the pagans. When we talk to the pagan, we're talking about those who have the religious uh, experiences of worshipping uh, creatures, uh, the nature, and so on. And uh, they are, in a way, superstitious. Instead of worshipping and knowing the Creator, the God and Father of all. And so they worship idols and other gods. And in our culture here, we always use the word Pai Pai. Even the Iban folks also know how to say Pai Pai. Okay, uh, they worship idols that cannot speak, that cannot see, that cannot hear, and that need people to carry, right? And these are uh, the religious uh, paganism that we come. And so they come in two kinds in this uh, opening chapter. 
First, we're going to look at Nineveh. Secondly, we're going to look at the sailors. Okay. So firstly, we look at Nineveh. All right. Nineveh was the capital city of the day, the capital city of Assyria uh, in the 8th century, which is 700 BC. The Assyrian Empire was the empire, the empire of that time. It was the world power that ruled. Uh, if you can see from the uh, Tigris to the Mediterranean Sea, right? And actually, we even went down to Egypt and actually conquered Egypt as well. But Jerusalem or uh, the Israel and Judah were in the midst uh, of that path of conquest. The whole of what we could call the Middle East, specifically Iraq today, was under the rule of Assyria. And it stood as a great threat to the nation of Israel and Judah. At that time, as we have learned through the minor prophets, Israel and Judah were divided into the two kingdoms. The northern kingdom called Israel, centered on Samaria with the ten tribes, and the southern kingdom called Judah, centered on Jerusalem. The Assyrians, this Jonah uh, was a time before the conquest of the northern kingdom. Now, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom and destroyed it. The, the whole ten tribes of Israel were lost to the Assyrians. They actually, uh, the Assyrians almost came to the point of conquering Jerusalem, right? They surrounded, in fact, and besieged Jerusalem. And we learned that as we went through the book of Hosea and also ultimately what will happen to the Assyrian kingdom in Nahum. So you know, King Hezekiah was reigning in Jerusalem at that time when the armies of uh, Assyria came and surrounded and besieged it for quite a number of years. But at the last minute, miraculously, the Assyrians packed up and went home. And there's a terrific story in the Bible that tells how God rescued them, the people of uh, Judah. And we know of it because the king of Assyria, uh, Tigla Pilisa, wrote up the fact that he did not conquer Jerusalem under King Hezekiah, but he destroyed the northern kingdom. Okay, this is an uh, impression of uh, what uh, Nineveh looks like, a massive uh, architecture uh, along the river, and it had 120,000 people living it, as Jonah tells us, and it has walls. The walls were massive, okay, and uh, 12 kilometers long that ran around the city with massive gates. This is one of the great cities of the ancient world. At the time of Jonah, it was a city of wealth, richness, power, and prestige because it has military might. Just like today in our world, if you have the military might, you will dominate. So the time of uh, uh, Jonah, it, it was a, a capital of an empire that was bent on conquest, on conquering and taking over different, different nations. So when we look at the opening verse of uh, Jonah, just now we read, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach for it. No, preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. The wickedness of Nineveh was the main observation that God has of this city. God does not say how beautiful, how magnificent this city is. And it is, right? This is the, uh, the palace uh, that they, they were working in. But God mentioned about its wickedness and its evil and the disasters that will come upon it. That is, as much as the external disasters that will come upon Assyria, the Nineveh, but also internally what is happening within the city. God wants Jonah to go and speak to them. So it applies for all of us, all the cities, city of Kuching, city of any country in the world, and all the people we will encounter evil and wickedness uh, in the cities that we live in. 
And the only thing is that when you have a, a huge city like Nineveh, it is magnified. The wickedness and the evil is magnified. And we have, you just need to read the news just the past couple of weeks, what is happening in our nation, how young children are being kidnapped, how young children are being abused, and women are being abused, and people are getting into fights. Uh, several days, I was told there was a road bully who beat up a lady, right? All this is in Kuching, a city which is supposed to be cultured, but all this is happening, and it's happening in, it happened in Nineveh, and so the city of Nineveh will be visited by the prophet of God, okay? But think about it for a moment, right? These are not Israelites. These are not the people of God. They were not the offspring of Abraham. These were not God's people under God's rule, under God's covenant. But still, whether you belong to God or not, you are accountable to God accountable for their immorality, accountable to God for their wickedness and for the disasters that have come upon them. So the troubles of the world that we live in and the evils and wickedness of the world that we live in is not only limited to the breaking of God's laws. Okay? As an example, remember Joseph in Egypt, right? He was a man who brought his family to Egypt and from there, they were there for 400 years until Moses delivered them. But before the law of Moses, Joseph refused to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife because he said he would not sin against God. But the law of adultery was only given 400 years later by Moses under the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. So what we see here is that wrong is wrong, whether the law declares it or not. And we live in a world today with shifting changes in the laws. I received a, a message uh, just a few days ago that in the US, certain states in the US have amended their laws so that the word father and mother will no longer be used. It is birth parent or non-birth parent because they are, uh, what do you call, trying to be inclusive for the uh, LGBTQ uh, group. And to me, when I read that, the first impression that came to me, I'm no longer a father. You're no longer a mother. In the birth certificate, there's no more father or mother. Right? but a parent, birth parent, or non-birth parent. Birth parent means the mother who gives birth. Non-birth parent means the father who did not give birth, but is the father of the child. Now that is in the States. The law has already been passed. Right? Now, to me, the, the biggest thing for me when I read that was that it is a total rejection of God. Because God is the father of all the families of the earth. When we prayed, we said, our heavenly Father. So it is a total rejection of God. It's not just about changing words, you know, so that you are more inclusive. Behind it, underneath it, is a total rejection of God. And that is something that we need to be aware, and we will pray against it so that the Word of God will continue to flourish. So we know that today, things are happening but wrong is wrong, right? Whether the law states it or not, before God, there is justice, okay? Um, so Nineveh and its wickedness, the thing that focused uh, for God was its wickedness and evil, not its magnificence, not its architecture, not its grandeur and, and, and richness and wealth, but the wickedness and God focuses on it. Okay. This is uh, modern day. Uh, they have some, done some restoration uh, to the, uh, what do you call, walls of Nineveh. And you can see it here in the uh, slide here. This is, I think, you can see the highway running past it. 
the walls that, uh, the thickness of the walls that ran along it, okay? And this is today, the rubbles, right, of uh, Nineveh. And as it's mentioned there, uh, the wickedness of, of, or evil of Nineveh was the main thing that God was focused on, right? Not its magnificence. So this is something that we want to, okay, now let's turn to the sailors, okay? Second group of people. First, Nineveh, the pagans, okay? Non-believers of God. Now let's turn to the second group, the sailors. And they are much more interesting here. Okay, um, I'm going to share this in, in uh, uh, six stages, okay? Uh, all the sailors were afraid, right? And we read in uh, chapter one, and they worship false gods. They prayed each according to their gods. And, but generally, the book of Jonah presents these pagans, unbelievers, in quite a favorable light. Let's go through it and see what it says. I've summarized it here. Okay, stage one. Let's consider. Stage one. They prayed to their own God and threw the cargo overboard when the storm came. Right? Now, part of this is to get Jonah to pray. They want him to pray to his God. So the captain says, how can you sleep? How is it that you can sleep in the midst of a storm? And that would be a question I would have. Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Now, the sailors, they are not sure which God is going to help them because they are praying to each of their own gods. But any God will do, right? And if we have come from a, a non-believing background, in fact, that is the life that I have experienced. Uh, in the family home, you have the kitchen God, looks up the kitchen. You have the other type of gods for certain other things. So you have a multiple gods that you worship to protect uh, the livelihood and the family and the lives of the, uh, the family. So here they are not sure. But any God will do. And that's what they're after. Stage two, they cast lots to see who is responsible for the storm. It's a superstition that they, they engage in. But if you go below it, they're actually asking for guidance from any God. Okay? Not knowing that His word is the wrong place to look for by asking the idols, right? not knowing actually that they have a prophet of God who speaks God's word in their very midst, but they are looking for guidance. And as we look at Alpha coming up, there will be people, right, over the last eight Alpha, there will be people who are looking for guidance. Okay, let's be aware of that. Keep this in mind as we look through this passage uh, with Alpha coming up. Okay, stage three. They are terrified when they hear about God. They are terrified and they ask Jonah, what have you done? Because they, they knew that he's running away from the Lord. The God they're afraid of is the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, translated from the Hebrew Yahweh, right? The word is uh, mentioned here is talking about they are afraid of Yahweh, the name of the God of Israel the true and living God. And he's described for them by Jonah, right? He says, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven. And this is the key verse that we want to look at this morning, right? That Jonah calls God, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now, stage four, we look at, next they ask the prophet for advice. What shall we do? Verse 11 and 12 says, The sea was getting rougher and rougher. Then they said, What can we do to make the sea calm down? And the advice they were given by Jonah himself seems to be a wicked or at least unwise advice. He says to the sailors, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Basically, kill me. Make me a sacrifice so that my God will calm down the sea that you are in the midst of. But of course, the sailors 
they did their best. They refused to do it. They just rode harder and harder. And uh, rather than to throw this seemingly innocent man overboard, to throw this prophet of his God into the sea. Stage five, when they've done their utmost, they are already spent, their energy is gone, and they know that they, what they're trying to do is failing, they finally do what the prophet tells them. But notice, when they do it, they do it with a prayer to Yahweh. They have been worshipping multiple gods, but this time, they do it with a prayer to Yahweh. Then they cried out to the Lord, verse 14, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Please, Lord, means please, Yahweh. Because Jonah has already informed them that the God we serve is Yahweh. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, Yahweh, have done as you please. Kill the prophet of Yahweh? Well, this is what Yahweh is doing for us. The storm that came because his prophet is running away from him. What will Yahweh do to us when we kill his prophet? There are people who have great respect for Yahweh now, but they have still more respect when the sea comes down and they see the reality of Yahweh. And that really terrifies them. Finally, we come to stage six. For they know it's Yahweh, they offer him sacrifices, and that's the last we see of them. The men we are written here greatly feared Yahweh, and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows to him. Let's look at this shifting of the pagans, the sailors. It's a very interesting picture as we see them move from multiple gods to acknowledging the true and living God of Israel, the God of all gods, the God of heaven. And we pray that this Alpha coming up, we will see that shift from maybe no gods, right? Rejecting God, or maybe from a background of multiple gods that they will shift to the true and living God and worship the God of heaven. And we see there's a big shift in the movement. The prophet Jonah was trying his very best to move away from God. But as Jonah the prophet runs away from God, the sailors, the pagans move towards God. Can you see that amazing work that God is doing? As Jonah does not care about Nineveh, Right? He runs away from the task that God has given him. But the sailors, the pagan, cared for him. They didn't want to throw him into the sea. Jonah doesn't fear God. Otherwise, he would not have run from God. Right? But they are terrified, the sailors. They are terrified of offending God. Can you see the heart of God giving us the people that he has a heart for? The pagans. So actually, what Jonah chapter 1 shows us puts the believer to shame. Puts the believer to shame. Right? Because they acknowledge the one and true God through the process. What Jonah, the prophet himself, was doing away from God, the pagan sailors were moving towards God. Before we turn the attention to the prophet Jonah, let's look at what jo uh, chapter 1 tells us about God and about beyond the reach of God. Jonah was trying to get out so that God cannot reach him. Right? Nineveh is the pagan city, just like a big, big major city of today like Beijing, London, Washington, Paris. The Olympics had just finished. All right? And yet God knew its sin and sent a messenger, a prophet, to that city. God may know the different people that we're going to invite, but God is going to meet with them. They will meet 
through the alpha course that we're going to conduct and could be through any other means. What we're seeing here is that God was concerned for Nineveh, not his people, a people that is a pagan, and God is concerned for the people that you and I are going to invite to Alpha. God is concerned. Know that as you invite. Don't be worried about rejection by them, or whatever. Know that God's heart is concerned for them, even though they may reject God at this point in time. But it is not beyond the reach of God, right? It is not beyond God's care, even though the people that we may invite may not acknowledge God even as Nineveh did not acknowledge God, yet God cared for 120,000 people and the sheep and the cattle. It was not the city of God. It was not his land. It was not his people. But God's heart goes beyond his people and his city and his land. So the sailors were never out of reach of the hand of God because you cannot go beyond the God who made the sea. They, in their superstition, were still not beyond God. Their God could have been local gods, national gods, family gods, but their gods could not help them. Yahweh, the God of Israel, He is the real God. And we are praying that those who attend the Alpha, they will encounter the real God. Amen? The true God, the God of heaven. He's the one who made the seas. He's the one who made the land. And you and I and the people that we're going to invite cannot run away from God. Such is great is God's love. So God lives outside our nationality. He lives outside our locality. He lives outside our family. We are never beyond the reach of the one true God of all humanity. And there's only one God like that. And he is called by, Noah, uh, by jo uh, Jonah, the, pro uh, the God of heaven who rules the, the world. Okay, we're going to move next uh, to the prophet himself. And uh, a question that I always ask as I re prepare and re read this chapter, why would he run away from God? A prophet, you know, a prophet of God. Right? Why would he run away from God? Right? And uh, this is uh, something that really uh, puzzles me, but let's go through it. Jonah is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible as well, 2 Kings uh, chapter 14. Uh, and of course, in the Gospels, pointing to the death and resurrection of Jesus, the message of Jonah was being used by the Lord Jesus. But very little is known about Jonah himself outside the book of Jonah. But from Jonah, the book that we're going to go through the next few weeks, we find a lot that we can learn about his character. All right? On hearing, okay, on hearing God's challenge to him, he runs away from the task that God has given him. To him, it is the worst task, the most terrible task that God can give to him. To go to his enemy, Nineveh, not just one person, two person, 120,000 people, right? To preach against that city. Whoa, that's very dangerous. You go there to welcome the city, it's okay. You are there to preach against the city, you will be stoned to death, okay? But what does he do? He immediately goes to Joppa. We don't know where he actually is. Right? But he's on a journey. Which part? But he heads in the opposite direction to Joppa on the Mediterranean Sea to board a ship that will not take him to Nineveh, that will take him away from Nineveh. Okay? But the whole issue is that no, jo uh, Jonah is not running away from Nineveh. He is running away from God. Right? He can run away from Nineveh, but he cannot run away from God. You and I can run away from any situation or geographical situation, but we cannot run away from God, who has made 
the sea and all the land who is the God of heaven. Many people have followed exactly Jonah's example and hearing the call of the Lord upon their lives have run away in the opposite direction. And we will find people similar to that. We invite them maybe for many, many times, but they have rejected. But the important thing is that they are not beyond the reach of God. So our role is to be faithful. Keep praying for them, keep inviting them. And today we're still the same. People who, who may hear the word of God, but try to run away from the message, right? The message that Jesus is king and that you and I need to submit to him, our life to him. But there may be people who are interested to find out about this God and God willing, God will touch their hearts as we invite them, as they attempt to find out for themselves, is it all right for me not to give my life to God, to Christ? They may want to find out, to answer that question rather than to answer the question of why they should uh, believe in God or receive God. They might want to understand, maybe uh, I've um, uh, met a person who has uh, gone part through of the Alpha course and he says, well, it's interesting, but it's not for me, right? And uh, he did not finish. Now, notice that Jonah acknowledges God in the midst of his running away. Because in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, sorry, Jonah chapter 1 verse 9, it says, I am a Hebrew and I am the one who served the God of heaven. He acknowledges God. He acknowledges Yahweh as his God. Just take note that if he had rejected God, if Jonah had rejected God, he would have sat still and have done nothing, right? He would neither obey the call, nor neither would he run away. So he's indifferent if he had rejected God. But he did not reject God, right? And the thing we want to highlight here is that the, the opposite of love is indifference, it's not hate. We think that it's either love or hate, but actually, in the word of God, it's indifference. I don't care. I, 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 you know, tidak apa, tidak peduli. I don't care. It's disinterest. Couldn't care less. That is the opposite of what we call love. It's not hate. Indifference, right? So the person who hates usually will love very fiercely. Apostle Paul hated the Christians, but when he was touched by God, his love for God was just extraordinary. So don't be afraid of people who reject you, who you think are very, very, um, uh, what do you call, uh, against you, opposing you. But the person who is indifferent, who couldn't care less, right, that's the person that will not have much response. It's the inaction that will show the unbelief of the person rather than the hostile reaction. So when you are publicly opposed, okay, I think it's the, okay, when you are opposed, uh, um, very often it is the people who oppose you that will uh, turn to God. So, this man, Jonah, was running away. But his very running away is an acknowledgement of the truth and that he is the God who loves him and who knows him. Jonah acknowledges this truth and today we will meet people who will know that the truth is in Jesus while they still want to run away from God. Okay? Because they do not want to live by the truth because it's inconvenient to live by the truth. That's why it's extraordinary that Jonah, even in his running away, he acknowledges God. And, and, uh, and he uh, is the one that tells uh, the pagans, sailors, who the God of heaven is. He knows his fault, Jonah, but there's no escaping. And uh, this is the, the thing that 
uh, God has uh, printed upon him. So we will finish here, but I would like us to take note here. With the Alpha coming up, we are in the process of praying and inviting people. Get to know this prayer. Get to know this prayer, okay? You may want to save it in your handphone. This morning, as I was, uh, we were having our Lord's Supper, my granddaughter asked me, Grandpa, why is it I cannot take the uh, bread and the cup? So I have to explain to him, we are asked not to take it because if, if we have not received Jesus. So I asked uh, her, have you received Jesus? She said, no. Would you like to receive Jesus now? She said, not yet. So I think this job for you, uh, my son, Jeshurun, uh, because your daughter raised up the question this morning, why can't I take part in the Lord's Supper? And uh, I think you have shared with her before all the illustration of the gospel. And she has grown over the years. And it's a great time, right? Have this ready. And I think oftentimes we fail to ask people after we have shared with them our testimony, would you consider receiving Jesus? Explain to them uh, the, 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 the prayer uh, about uh, how it is we are acknowledging ourselves that we are in need of forgiveness, right? And we thank God for what he has done to us through the second paragraph, through what Jesus had done. And lastly, to commit ourselves, right? To ask uh, God to come into our lives and uh, to, to take over our lives as our ruler and king. It's a very simple prayer. Uh, Brother Gan this morning led us in a prayer also. All right, a similar short prayer before the Lord's Supper. But I encourage you, especially with Alpha coming up, be ready to invite. It's okay if they say, no, I'm not ready yet. My granddaughter said to me, not yet. Grandpa, not yet. And I respect that. But let's continue to pray. Obviously, the Lord's Supper has triggered something in her life. And she is in that process of coming to know God. Okay, I would like us to end by praying this prayer together. It's a prayer that we can pray at any time, even though we have received uh, uh, the Lord Jesus. But I think I want us to also, before we pray this prayer, uh, the whole issue about Jonah. I think in this time of uh, preparing, can a prophet, we always think the prophet is so godly and so holy. But I think from chapter 1, we find that this prophet is very arrogant. This prophet is very self-centered. This prophet is very grumpy, very long-faced, right? Wanting to do what he wants to do, not what God wants him to do, right? So do we have prophets like that? Have we met prophets like that? I think they are human. And they are also... God is doing their work in their lives. They are still work in progress, right? They are not the perfect prophet that we think. Wow, we think uh, Isaiah is such a uh, massive uh, figure in the Old Testament or Elijah. Hey, read through the scriptures and you find that they are just like you and me. They are work in progress. God has not finished working with them. And God did not finish working with Jonah. And as we go through the next few weeks, there's a sadness as we look at how great the heart of God is for a people that is not his own, the Assyrians. And how small the heart of the prophet is. How grumpy he is. How sulking he is. Right? And that shows the big contrast between God and us. Okay, let's pray with this prayer. And if there's anyone here today who have never prayed this prayer before, let this be the day that you pray and you come into a relationship with God and be part of the family of God. Let's pray. Just follow me, okay? Dear God, I know that I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I am guilty of rebelling against you. 
and ignoring you. I need forgiveness. Just like Jonah needed forgiveness, uh, we need forgiveness. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Thank you that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Over to uh, Brother Jim. Thank you, Pastor, for the spiritual food for this week. Um, we have come to the end of the celebration this Sunday. Uh, we will go out from here, going find God in all our deeds until we meet again. Uh, do join us uh, for some refreshment at the foyer outside. Thank you.